Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at the vertical hover capabilities of Final Fantasy VII's iconic airship, the High Wind, and asking a very simple question. Can she actually hover like we see in the game? When the party first reaches Juno, we find the High Wind floating above the Junon airstrip. Since the High Wind has no real landing gear that we're aware of, it's relying on its two vertical engines to keep it afloat. To answer whether these engines generate sufficient lift to keep the High Wind hovering, we need to evaluate if the thrust they produce is enough to counteract the airship's weight. We're given two different weights here, the tear weight of 1,380 metric tons, which is the empty weight of the ship, as if it had just come out of the factory, and the gross weight of 2,150 metric tons, which includes equipment, crew, fuel, and any armaments. We'll evaluate against both just for the sake of completeness, but both are very large for an aircraft. By comparison, the takeoff weight of a double-decker Airbus A380 is 560 tons, making the task of keeping the high wind hovering like trying to keep four A380s in the air at one time. We'll once again lean on the aerodynamics of actuator disc theory for an aircraft in hover, which states that the thrust generated by the rotor is equal to two times the density of air times the area of the rotor times the velocity of air at the rotor squared. Density of air is a constant, so that's easy. We can get the area of the rotor by measuring its diameter in the high winds 3D model, dividing it by two, squaring it, and then multiplying it by pi. That leaves us needing the velocity of air at the rotor before we can solve for the thrust. To back that out, we'll rely on the power-thrust relationship, which states that the power equals the thrust times the velocity. If we plug that in, we can rearrange the equation to solve for the velocity of air at the rotor. The only remaining question is what do we plug in for the power? Although this is partially given to us in the original game's source material, determining the final power number that we should use gets a bit tricky and a bit technical. The call out here is that these ascent engines are rated at 15,200 liftoff horsepower each. To achieve that, Sid has connected four radial aircraft engines of 3,800 horsepower each together to make a gigantic 96 cylinder engine. 3,800 times four is 15,200, so that math checks out. However, this last part is a bit strange, and I think it either has to be a mistranslation or a typo. It says that each propeller, or rotor, requires two cylinders for movement. But that would mean that we have something like 48 rotors, which is certainly not what we have. The original game only had one rotor per engine pod, and here in the redesign we clearly have two. Probably what it meant to say was that each rotor needs two engines for movement, so a total of 30,400 liftoff horsepower. Now, how do we deal with the fact that the two main rotors on this new high wind are spinning in opposite directions? That is, they are counter-rotating. If we slow down the rotor animation, we can see that the bottom rotor is spinning clockwise and the top rotor is spinning counterclockwise. This is achieved through some intricate engineering in the engine's gearbox, but simply adding an extra rotor does not double your thrust output. To understand why this configuration is so advantageous and the benefit it gives the new high wind over its original predecessor, we can take a look at this NASA technical specification from the 1980s. In the report, we see that efficiencies of about 80% were achievable for single rotation prop fans. If that sounds familiar, that's because 80% is the efficiency number we used in our tiny Bronco analysis. However, with contra rotation, swirl recovery reduces the magnitude of efficiency degradations at high power and low tip speed, which describes our high wind use case almost perfectly. And if we look at figure 4 within the report, we see that counter rotating systems have efficiencies between 94 and 96%. And that is where the power of counter rotation shows up in the efficiency, which in turn does improve our overall thrust. We'll settle on 95 for this analysis, which is a big boost from our tiny Bronco given the high wind's advanced rotor configuration. Now that we have the power configuration sorted out, we can finally solve the velocity of air at the rotor 
to be 15.73 meters per second, and then go on and use that back in our original thrust equation. Crunching all the numbers, each rotor generates 1.35 million newtons of thrust, and the combination of the two generates 2.7 million overall. If we had used the 80% efficiency of the single rotor system, we would have only generated 2.4 million newtons, or about 12% less than what we have now. So while we definitely didn't double our thrust, we're still better off thanks to this new redesign. For the sake of completeness, let's also add these altitude maintenance engines rated at 1900 horsepower each, driving what I assume are these rotors here. Doing the same analysis with the new rotor area and power nets us an extra 161,000 newtons of thrust between the two maintenance engines, for a grand total of 2.86 million. Unfortunately, we need roughly 21 million newtons of upward thrust to keep the high wind hovering given its immense weight, so we're actually way off with the engines alone. Fortunately for us, the high wind is classified as an airship, so if it stays true to that name, that means it's hollow, at least in part, and filled with a lighter than air gas to exert a buoyancy force to help keep it floating. Buoyancy force helps keep ships afloat in water, but the same principle applies to air. A helium balloon floats because the helium inside the balloon is less dense than the surrounding air, resulting in a buoyancy force that exceeds the weight of the balloon. We know from the original FF7 that when you enter the high wind, you go down a set of stairs into the gondola section, and the cockpit is here in this forward section. This is also the section that the party is in at the end of the game when they escape the northern crater. Similar to a Goodyear blimp that has a cabin area and then its envelope, these pods here on the side and this upper section outside of what looks to be a forward observation deck can all contain a lighter than air gas such as helium to help keep the airship afloat. The reason we're going to go with helium instead of hydrogen even though hydrogen is lighter is because hydrogen results in this, which is not what we would want especially when we're being attacked by giant weapons. Using the 3D model, we can calculate the volume of helium in each of these pods and the envelope, adjusting a bit for the empty space since they're not perfectly rectangular. The overall net buoyancy force will be the difference in the density of air and the helium, times gravity, times the volume of the high winds pods and its envelope, a total of 1.06 million newtons, or 240,000 pounds. Between our buoyancy force and our engines, we amass 3.92 million newtons of upward force, but we're still way off the 21 million that we actually need. It's also way off even the tear weight. In fact, if we had a cube with the same dimensions as the high wind and filled its entire volume of roughly 1 million cubic meters with pure helium, we'd generate 10.4 million newtons of buoyancy force. Adding the thrust of the lift engines, we could amass 13.28 million newtons, which is really close to what we need to overcome the tear weight, but again, that's just an empty cube. Another way to look at this would be to say that the entire difference between the gross weight and the tear weight is just the helium lifting gas. It's not because then we wouldn't have any people or equipment, but if we did somehow get 770 metric tons of helium, it would occupy a space of 4.28 million cubic meters because of its density and generate 43.88 million newtons of buoyancy force. So that would definitely lift you, but you can see the problem here. If we rewind a second, we just calculated that amount of helium would take up 4.28 million cubic meters. But we also showed that an empty cube the size of the high wind has a volume of only 1 million cubic meters. It just doesn't work. There would simply be nowhere to put that much helium. In the end, the high wind is simply too heavy. And the real answer is that it needs to be lighter, about one-fifth of its current weight in order to sustain hover and vertical flight. Therefore, we're going to have to unfortunately call this busted. But there is always hope, so a few thoughts before we close. First, if we really wanted to brute force this, we could go full rocket mode and grab eight of SpaceX's Raptor 3 engines. It feels like the developers were actually onto something here late in the game. Hopefully we get some updated information in the near future about this redesigned version of the high wind. While some of the dimensions, such as the overall length of the ship at 237 meters, do seem to match between the original source material, the model, and then the game, the other dimensions like the width and the height certainly do not. 
That's why I suspect that this weight specification could be changed and even revised lower in the future, allowing us to achieve hover just in time for part three. Until then, we're just gonna have to rely on Sid's magic touch to keep this ship flying. Hope you enjoyed the analysis, toss any questions you might have in the comments, and thanks for watching.